Hi, welcome everyone. Um, on behalf of the Massachusetts ME, CFS, and FM Association to our first Sunday conversation of 2024. Um, we're really excited to see you all and thank you all for coming. Um, you are here from many states across the country and not only Massachusetts, um, so we're really happy for the crowd we have today. And we invite you to put a hello message in the chat and tell us where you're Zooming in from. Um, I'm Helen McGonigal. I'm from Pennsylvania and I'm the moderator for the program today. And before we start, I just wanted to share a few reminders about the pro about the presentation. Um, this is being recorded and the recording will be made available afterward. The chat will not be included in the recording. And because we have such a large number of attendees, uh, we are using the webinar format for today. So all attendees are muted automatically. After the main presentation, our speaker will be available to answer questions, but we ask that you please type your questions into the Q&A box specifically so that others can see the questions being asked and avoid sending duplicates. Um, I'll review the questions and cover as many as we have time for, and you can use the chat today to say hello and submit any comments you have as the program continues. Um, two important reminders, we cannot answer any questions that relate to your specific medical or legal condition, and MassME is pleased to provide the opportunity and format for these discussions, but the presenter's remarks are their own opinions and do not necessarily represent the views or opinions of the Massachusetts MECFS and FM Association. Um, so if you haven't said hello yet um, and where you are from in the chat, feel free to do so now. Uh, so I just wanna welcome everyone as they're coming in. Hello, um, this is our first Sunday conversation of 2024. Um, and today's program is titled, It's Not All in Your Head. Uh, so I'd like to extend a special welcome as well to our MassME members. Your membership makes it possible for the organization to host and sustain this Sunday conversations, support groups, patient services, and more. And if you'd like to learn more about how membership helps the organization or to become a member, uh, please visit our website at massmecfs.org slash join. Um, so Judy, if you want to join us, um, I'll introduce today's speaker. So uh, Judy Suzanne Race Safir, MD. Uh, she's a holistic healer, activist, artist, and gardener with a private practice of holistic psychiatry and psychoanalysis located in Newton, Massachusetts. She's a board certified adult and child psychiatrist and psychoanalyst and is on the faculty of Harvard Medical School and the Boston Psychoanalytic Institute and she teaches and supervises at the Cambridge Health Alliance. Um, she has a particular interest in combining spiritual and developmental approaches to healing, ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, helping patients wean from psychiatric medications, and treating complex chronic medical conditions that present psychiatrically, um, including mold toxicity, mast cell activation, and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome. She's a practitioner of a variety of energy healing and esoteric modalities, including astrology, tarot, shamanism, body intuitive, and Reiki. And her practice is dedicated to healing through the integration of heart, mind, body, soul, and the biosphere and cosmos. And her new book um, titled Sacred Psychiatry, Bridging the Personal and Transpersonal to Transform Health and Consciousness, uh, was just published by Greenleaf book group earlier this month, and the book is about holistic approach to cultivating resilience and courage during these transform transformative, excuse me, times on our planet. Um, so today she's joining us and we'll discuss the multimodal holistic approach that she takes in her practice for the treatment of three conditions commonly associated with MECFS and long COVID. Um, these include mast cell activation syndrome or MCAS, mold toxicity, and Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, or EDS, um, with a focus on MCAS as the treatments for these can often benefit um, people with all three of these conditions. So welcome, Judy, and thank you so much for presenting today. We're really lucky to have you, so feel free to take it away. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm very honored by this invitation to speak to your group today. I feel very aligned with the aim of your organization to provide support to people living with chronic complex medical illnesses and to provide knowledge, resources, community, and hope. That's an inspiring mission. My intention and wish is to uplift you by my talk today, to empower you to advocate in the most effective way for yourselves, 
and to introduce you to fresh perspectives regarding healing approaches and considerations that could be helpful. The service that this organization provides is more important and needed than ever, given that increasing numbers of people today are suffering from chronic dysregulation of their immune, nervous, and endocrine systems due to trauma, infections, and the toxicity of the environment, both physically and energetically. In the name of efficiency during this talk, I'm going to, I'm going to group CFS, ME, fibromyalgia, Ehlers-Danlos, long COVID, dysautonomia, and POTS all together under the rubric of chronic complex medical illnesses, rather than naming each of these conditions individually. They all indeed have so much in common. When Charmaine invited me to participate in the Sunday Conversation speaker series, she described that the theme for this year's talks was comorbidities that are found in patients with chronic complex medical illness. She thought that my talk would be a good introduction to the series, given that all of these conditions often are accompanied by anxiety, depression, insomnia, and cognitive issues, which are all symptoms that prompt consultation with a psychiatrist and about which I have written. Charmaine asked me to write a short description of the talk for the purposes of announcing the presentation to the membership, which I did before I crafted the talk. I originally intended to discuss mast cell activation, mold toxicity, and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, but as I wrote, I realized that it would make more sense to simply focus upon mast cell activation, which frequently causes the symptoms seen in mold toxicity and many that are seen in EDS. Mold toxicity and Ehlers-Danlos syndrome are huge complex subjects, which would require an entire dedicated presentation to do them justice. Next slide, please. Here's a list of the topics that we will be covering today. Next slide, please. So I wanted to start, up, start off my presentation with a cartoon that I get a kick out of. I don't know if you can read it. It says, we can't figure it out. Mind if we call in a quack? <laughs> so next slide, please. This is a quote by Dr. Andrew Weil, one of the fathers of integrative medicine. As any doctor can tell you, the most crucial step towards healing is having the right diagnosis. If the disease is precisely identified, a good res resolution is far more likely. Conversely, a bad diagnosis usually means a bad outcome, no matter how skilled the physician. Due to my training in the treatment of environmentally acquired illness, in addition to the usual symptoms of depression, anxiety, insomnia, and attentional problems that frequently occasion a consultation with a psychiatrist, many patients who seek my help are also suffering from chronic complex medical illnesses characterized by diverse and fluctuating physical symptoms that afflict multiple organ systems. Chronic debilitating fatigue is common, as is chronic pain in many parts of the body. Heart and respiratory issues, as well as asthma and frequent sinus infections are common. Patients frequently report digestive symptoms, peculiar neurological symptoms. Many patients report rashes and hives, itchiness and swollen lymph nodes, as well as severe symptoms related to the genitourinary tract. A blog post that I wrote in May of last year entitled Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, often misdiagnosed as a primary psychiatric condition, could also accurately have been entitled Chronic Complex Medical Illness, often misdiagnosed as a primary psychiatric condition, as there are so many commonalities and similarities between ME, CFS, FM, dysautonomia, mast cell activation, mold toxicity, and long COVID, which prompt inappropriate referral to psychiatrists who typically only have psychotropic medications to offer as treatment. That post really struck a nerve, was shared widely on the internet and occasioned a torrent of grateful comments from readers. Some literally reported that the post had brought them to tears because not only did they feel recognized and validated, but that it provided diagnostic directions to pursue, which could make sense of the strange and fluctuating symptoms that they and often their children suffered. 
Next slide, please. Misdiagnosis can literally have tragic consequences. When a patient who is suffering from any of these conditions sees an internist, pediatrician, or family practice doctor, the practitioners are likely to run many tests and do many laboratory studies, all of which do not show anything treatable. There is indeed an underlying cause which is causing the constellation of seemingly unrelated symptoms, but since the cause is not recognized or able to be measured with conventional testing, it cannot be diagnosed or treated. When a patient's distressing symptoms are not alleviated and no answers or effective treatment is forthcoming, they may become more insistent about something being very wrong. This can lead to a serious conflict between the patient and the clinician and a rupture of the relationship. Eventually, the frustrated clinician will often refer them to a psychiatrist or other mental health professional for counseling. They may be given a diagnosis of conversion disorder defined as a psychological condition in which a person has blindness, paralysis, or other neurological symptoms that cannot be explained by medical evaluation. The traditional psychoanalytic understanding of conversion disorder is that it is a physical manifestation of unresolved conflict due to unbearable or unacceptable thoughts or feelings. This is obviously very invalidating and psychologically damaging and denies the fact that their symptoms are a direct result of an underlying medical condition and not due primarily to emotional factors. It is even more tragic when the patient is a child and the parent desperately tries to find an answer or solution to their child's many physical symptoms by seeking consultation with one doctor after another. This parent eventually runs the risk of being diagnosed with factitious disorder, formerly co called Munchausen's disorder by proxy. It is akin to the former psychoanalytic misunderstanding of autism as being due to having a refrigerator mother. The autistic child's abnormal development was understood to result from maternal coldness and a lack of caring rather than a poorly understood organic brain disorder, which is due at least in part to a lack of capacity to de detoxify an overload of toxins and has absolutely nothing to do with the quality of parent-child relating. Not only is this a type, not only is this type of misdiagnosis a sin of commission in that it directly causes psychological damage, but it also results in sins of omission. The symptoms of EDS, ME, CFS, POTS, and dysautonomia can be treated supportively with physical interventions if properly recognized, and mast cell activation syndrome and mold toxicity are often very treatable if accurately diagnosed. It is crucial, however, to not reflexively resort to the default conclusion that it's all in the patient's head and due to stress, anxiety, or depression, and that they should see a therapist and start psychiatric medication. Dysautonomia, particularly, is often misdiagnosed as a psychiatric disorder because it can present symptomatically as anxiety, panic, attention deficit disorder, and hypomania. These patients often have very poor sleep quality, due to chronic pain, which then leads to daytime fatigue, exhaustion, and poor stress resilience. This depletion puts them into survival mode and further activates their sympathetic nervous system, resulting in a state of chronic fight or flight. Chronic hyperarousal can create the appearance of a generalized anxiety disorder, or if they have surges of adrenaline due to autonomic dysfunction, they can appear to be having a panic attack. This state of sympathetic hyperarousal can manifest as restlessness or hyperactivity, which can be mistaken for attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Sometimes their ability to power through and continue to function on very little sleep is mistaken for hypomania. Since they are so tired, they often make mistakes, misplace things, and have trouble concentrating, and thus look like they are suffering from attention deficit disorder. Psychiatric diagnoses are generally diagnoses of exclusion, meaning that the condition does not qualify if it is a consequence of an underlying medical problem. If a patient is sleeping poorly due to chronic pain as a result of a chronic complex medical condition, and thus they are exhausted and consequently their cognition is impaired, it is inappropriate to diagnose attention deficit disorder. If they did have a good night's sleep, they would not be forgetful or have trouble concentrating. 
when they are referred to a psychiatrist, due to the ignorance of the underlying actual medical cause of their condition, they are routinely prescribed psychiatric medications. This can sometimes be helpful, but more often it will either do nothing or make their symptoms worse. In addition, dysautonomia does respond to appropriate treatment, which consists of efforts to improve sleep quality, control chronic pain, provide adequate salt and fluid intake, avoid hypoglycemia, effectively manage stress and get adequate rest. Without identifying the underlying cause, an appropriate treatment will not be offered. Next slide, please. Mast cell activation syndrome, or MCAS. It's my impression that often the common denominator mediating many of these diverse conditions and symptoms is dysfunction and overreactivity of the mast cells. For this reason, as I said, I'm going to discuss MCAS today and leave the discussion of other comorbidities to future speakers. I will discuss a couple of treatments that regularly stabilize and regulate mast cells and an under-discussed environmental factor to consider, which can adversely impact mast cell function. The two treatments are the Gupta program and low-dose naltrexone, and the environmental factor is electromagnetic radiation. I will also briefly discuss ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, which is a new modality for me that I'm offering in my practice, but which in my mind shows great promise to ease the suffering of those with chronic complex medical conditions. I don't have enough direct experience yet to make that claim, but I intuit that it will be the case. Mast cells are white blood cells that are part of the immune system and function as a bridge between the immune and the nervous system, acting to coordinate the two. Their primary function is to defend against toxins and infectious agents. Mast cells can be found in all tissues of the body but the highest concentrations are located in those parts of the body that interface with the outside world and are thus exposed to infections and toxins. These include the sinuses, throat, skin, gastrointestinal, respiratory, and genitourinary tracts. Mast cells are filled with vesicles called granules that contain more than 200 different biochemical signalers. When a toxin or infectious agent is introduced, an individual with a well-functioning immune system will mobilize their mast cells to orchestrate an appropriately measured response. The mast cells release their biochemical mediators, most prominently histamine, serotonin, and tryptase to neutralize the danger. If a person's immune system has become dysregulated and hyperaroused, the mast cells can become overreactive. Instead of releasing their biochemical mediators in an appropriately self-limited way, they become disorganized and degranulate chaotically, causing the wide range of symptoms I enumerated earlier. Treatment consists of stabilizing the membranes of the mast cells so that they do not degranulate and calming down the nervous system. A protocol of antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers is often helpful and for some a low histamine diet. Improvement can be immediate or take up to two months. In my practice, many patients with symptoms of MCAS respond to the standard treatment with antihistamines and mast cell stabilizers with significant symptom relief. It is generally true that in the holistic health and functional medicine field that there is much disagreement. This is the case about the diagnosis and treatment of MCAS. There is one school of thought that demands that rigorous diagnostic criteria be met, including confirmatory laboratory studies, to qualify for a diagnosis of MCAS. Once the diagnosis is established, MCAS is treated symptomatically. It is not considered necessary or important to identify an underlying trigger such as mold toxicity or chronic tick-borne illness. In contrast, I make the diagnosis clinically without laboratory studies and would like, if possible, to, identifying, to identify the underlying root cause, which most often in my practice is mold toxicity. Mold toxicity is extremely common, causes enormous suffering, and is often very treatable, though it is a long-term project. Next slide, please. Chronic complex medical illnesses involve the mind, body, and spirit, which is very different than saying it's all in your head. Most patients with MCAS 
also have limbic system dysregulation, a malfunction of the deep structures of the brain that is a trauma response. It manifests as an individual feeling in a constant state of hyperarousal, a fight, flight, or freeze, and they can greatly benefit from limbic system retraining. A negative feedback loop exists between the limbic system and the mast cells, and when the limbic system is dysregulated, it causes the mast cells to degranulate, causing the symptoms associated with MCAS. Similarly, the degranulation of the mast cells further dysregulates the limbic system. Living with chronic complex medical illness causes a trauma response with sympathetic nervous system hyperarousal, as there can be so much fear. Reasons to be afraid include that doctors often don't know what's going on with you and have little helpful to offer, worries that you're never going to feel better, and misdirected blame and criticism against the self for feeling miserable so much of the time. Next slide, please. The Gupta program is a highly researched mind-body-spirit practice that is extremely helpful and effective for calming down the limbic system. It is a self-guided program that can be downloaded from the internet and consists of simple brain retraining exercises and guided meditations. It's an essential component of treatment for most of my patients, regardless of their diagnosis. It's incredibly clear, simple, well-structured, and characterized by a feeling tone of love, caring, reassurance, and peace. Most people in our culture are currently living in a state of chronic hyperarousal and dread due to the relentless cycle of bad news, violence at home and abroad, political dysfunction, and dramatic evidence of accelerating climate collapse, which is all playing out against a backdrop of dizzying change related to advancements in technology. These factors can only be anticipated to intensify. Most people are in dire need of regulating their autonomic nervous systems. I regularly recommend that my patients commit to doing the Gupta program daily, as calming down the limbic system is a crucial component of healing. Those patients with multiple chemical sensitivities or those who are extraordinarily sensitive to light or sound or hypersensitive to electromagnetic frequencies or those who have adverse reactions to many foods, at times including even a glass of water, are all suffering from MCAS and can benefit from treatments to stabilize the mast cells, particularly limbic system retraining programs like the Gupta program. Next slide, please. Low-dose naltrexone. There is one pharmaceutical that I routinely recommend to patients who are suffering from any type of autoimmune illness, MCAS, or any chronic complex medical condition, which is low-dose naltrexone. It is safe, inexpensive, and for most and for some patients, makes a huge difference in pain reduction and systemic inflammation. In my mind, it makes it always worth a trial. Many patients, many people have heard of naltrexone which is a medication prescribed at higher doses and is used to redu reduce cravings. Low-dose naltrexone is prescribed at doses between 0.25 and 4 point milligrams daily rather than 150 milligrams a day of naltrexone. At these low doses, the medication briefly blocks the opioid receptors for a few hours. Subsequently, a rebound effect occurs with increased production of endorphins resulting in enhanced feelings of well-being, as well as reduction in pain and systemic inflammation. Low-dose naltrexone appears to stabilize the mast cells and to have immune-modulating effects. There are usually very few side effects. The most common one is vivid dreams, which typically resolves after a few days, but can recur when the dose is increased. Other side effects that have been reported include anxiety, headaches, gastrointestinal symptoms, and insomnia but these side effects are typically mild and transient, if in fact any are experienced at all. Low-dose naltrexone appears to have immune-modulating effects. In some patients, it helps stabilize the mast cells and decreases systemic inflammation. There are studies reporting its efficacy not only in classic autoimmune illnesses, but also in such diverse, con chronic com diverse conditions, such as chronic complex medical conditions that we've been discussing, 
but also cancer, autism, chronic pain, and complex regional pain syndromes, AIDS, and psychiatric symptoms, such as PTSD, anxiety, and depression. In that way, it reminds me of an adaptogenic herb in that it seems to have its own innate intelligence and functions to flexibly address that which requires healing. It cannot be obtained from a conventional pharmacy and must be compounded. The effective and tolerated dosage varies. The approach is individualized and a matter of trial and error. Next slide, please. The dangers of electromagnetic radiation. The cells in our bodies communicate with each other via, via electrochemical signaling, and thus all of us are vulnerable to the disruptive effects of electro electromagnetic radiation, and it can have a deleterious effect upon our health. But some patients with MCAS are particularly sensitive, and limiting their exposure can make a huge difference in the severity of their symptoms. If you have never been diagnosed with MCAS, but have chronic complex medical illness, it may be that the, the mast cells are playing more of a role in your condition than you appreciated, and limiting your exposure to electromagnetic frequencies could make a difference. This is not easy because these frequencies are ubiquitous and their power is only increasing as wireless technology networks transition from 5, 4G to 5G and coverage becomes more extensive. Prior to 200 years ago, our only exposure to electromagnetic radiation came from sunlight and other cosmic sources, lightning and geomagnetic forces. That is not the case today. Electricity and our capacity to store it are at the foundation of modern civilization. Electricity has enabled all the staggering, rapid technological and scientific advancements of the modern era. The applications of electromagnetic technology, however, has resulted in our ever-increasing bombardment and exposure to higher frequencies and dosages of radiation. Humans cannot see, touch, taste, or smell this radiation, which understandably contributes to our capacity to deny the risks of exposure. Its effects accrue over time and are proportional to the duration and intensity of exposure. Some EMFs cause damage to our intricate and delicate DNA and are related to the development of cancers, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, neurodegenerative diseases, infertility, and depression. This is a quote from the scientist Dr. Martin Blank, author of the excellent book Overpowered, published in 2015. Scientists, doctors, and researchers have long accepted that ionizing radiation such as the ultraviolet rays that accompany sunlight or the x-rays that you are exposed to in your doctor or dentist's office can harm and destroy DNA. It has been assumed, however, that non-ionizing radiation from power lines, television broadcasting, and cell phones did not harm DNA. This is not the case. Non-ionizing radiation can also react with and harm DNA, which can cause mutations and even cell death and can lead directly to serious medical illness. Just as the tobacco industry suppressed the scientific evidence regarding the hazards of cigarette smoking, there is a profit-motivated strategy to manufacture doubt about the negative health consequences of wireless technology. There has been a repeated assertion that there is no proven link between wireless frequencies and human illness, that the data is inconclusive. Dr. Blank wrote, I quote, it appears that the response of governments and industry groups to this lack of specific cause and effect relationship between non-thermal, meaning exposure that doesn't heat, non-thermal exposure to EMF and negative health effects has been to formulate regulations and safety standards that ignore those negative effects completely. While there is plenty of science indicating the presence of significant health risks at, at non-thermal levels, meaning those levels that do not cause heating of the tissues, as far as safety standards and regulatory frameworks are concerned, EMF is harmful to humans only at levels powerful enough to result in increased temperature. No recognition at all is given to any potential health effects at lower non-thermal levels of non-ionizing electromagnetic radiation. 
even though non-thermal biological effects have been scientifically demonstrated for over a century. Next slide, please. Here's a very partial list of some of the basic steps you can take to reduce your exposure. A complete list can be found in a blog post on my website entitled Electromagnetic Radiation, a Public Health Crisis, as well as in my new book, Sacred Psychiatry. I know that implementing these re recommendations can feel inconvenient and like a hassle, but it is important. Making even small changes can make differences cumulatively. I always try to remember to talk with my patients about EMF hygiene to minimize their exposure. So here's a list of some things that you can do. One, there's an inverse relationship between the distance a cell phone is from the body and its disruptive impact on electrochemical signaling. Thus, do not keep a cell phone in your pocket unless you put it on airplane mode. Two, don't live near high voltage power lines or transformers. Three, do not talk on the cell phone with it placed against your ear. Put it on speaker mode and lay it down on the table during a call. Four, laptops do not belong in your lap. Five, if you live in a freestanding house, turn off the router at night. If you live in a condo or apartment building, it unfortunately makes less difference. Six, minimize use of the microwave, but if you must use it, leave the kitchen when it's in use and take your pets with you. I recommend that you try to make these changes for a month and observe yourself to see if you notice a difference in the severity of your symptoms. It's my hope that if you are suffering from chronic medical illness, mediated by MCAS, that this discussion of some of these strategies and considerations will eventually result in decrease in the severity of your symptoms. Unfortunately, if you approach your regular primary care physician and ask them to evaluate, evaluate you for MCAS or request them to prescribe LDN, it is unlikely that your regular doctor will be willing or able to help. You do not need a doctor's participation to implement the Gupta program or to be more mindful of electromagnetic radiation hygiene. Next slide, please. Ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, or CAP. Ketamine is the only psychedelic medicine that is currently legal to prescribe in Massachusetts. In low doses, it has been safely used to alleviate suffering in a wide variety of conditions, including depression and anxiety, post-traumatic stress syndrome, obsessive compulsive disorder, addiction, eating disorders, pain syndromes, ruminative suicidality, anxiety related to the end of life, and very fruitfully for personal exploration and spiritual growth. It can also potentially contribute to the healing of the psycho-spiritual component of chronic complex medical conditions, which is why I'm mentioning it here today. As I have discussed, all of these conditions frequently involve activation of the limbic and autonomic nervous systems and are thus accompanied by prominent psychiatric symptoms. Ketamine soothes the limbic system and acts like a nervous system tonic. The expanded states of consciousness induced by ketamine combined with psychotherapy can amplify holistic healing. Ketamine stimulates neuroplasticity and acts like a sort of miracle grow for the brain particularly in the seven to 10 days following a session. Many patients find that ketamine helps them to shift habitual thought patterns and supports thinking about things in, a fresh, in fresh ways. A typical ketamine session is three hours long. In my practice, I administer ketamine via sublingual lozenge. A course of treatment usually consists of weekly cap sessions for six consecutive weeks with meetings for psychotherapeutic integration scheduled in between ketamine sessions. Some of my patients have very fruitfully recreated the expanded states of consciousness experienced during ketamine journeys while practicing the brain retraining component of the Gupta program. The two modalities can function synergistically. Some patients are just too depressed and feel too defeated to have the motivation and energy to engage in the self-care practices which are essential to successfully approach their healing holistically. It can feel overwhelming to implement an anti-inflammatory diet or to practice the Gupta program consistently. In these cases, ketamine sometimes can help a patient feel well enough to participate in their treatment. The experience during the ketamine journey itself can, off, 
can often can offer deep relaxation, a feeling of dissociation from the body, which provides a temporary respite from their suffering and a sense of profound connection with something larger than themselves. I've only been using ketamine in my practice since July, but I'm very impressed with its healing potential. Next slide, please. Spiritual condition, spiritual condi considerations. When a person is feeling ill, when they're deeply fatigued, when their cognition is clouded by brain fog, or when they are experiencing chronic pain, they can have difficulty feeling open to connecting with their spirit. Ironically, during these times, spiritual guidance and support are needed more than ever. It has been my experience that most patients seem to need a certain minimal level of well-being to feel open to experiencing gratitude, to be in a state of appreciation for all the blessings, to have the energy and bandwidth to consider offering themselves in service to others. Effectively treating MCAS can support a person's physical well-being and provide the symptom relief that can open them to being available for spiritual connection. A feedback loop is created by connecting spiritually, which uplifts, calms, and fortifies, and which in turn facilitates further physical healing and well-being. At these times of transition and turmoil on the planet, physical well-being is foundational for cultivating the resilience and courage to meet these challenges and not to succumb to overwhelm and despair. In my new book, Sacred Psychiatry, the longest chapter and the true heart of the book is entitled Reclaiming a Multidimensional Way of Being in the World. It asserts the vital importance of developing a sense of spiritual connection to heal. Many patients who consult with me in my practice have a deep longing for a more soulful experience of their lives, but have no idea about how to go about this. Without an experience of themselves as more than their physical body, lacking a sense of why they were born and what they were meant to do in this lifetime, they can be vulnerable to feelings of dread, alienation, and hopelessness. In my book, I describe a great variety of easy to implement practices that can help a person tune into something larger than themselves and to connect with a feeling of oneness. One of my favorite recommendations in the book is a description of a practice called the blessing way. Angelus Arian was a cultural anthropologist who studied comparative spiritual practices and shamanism. In 2014, a year before she died, she gave a wonderful TED Talk entitled Cornerstones of Wisdom, The Fourfold Way. In it, she described a practice that she called the Blessing Way that she derived from studying the spiritual practices of cultures from around the world and identifying the similarities between them. Three practices were common to all of those that she studied. The first is prayer or setting a sacred intention. Some people are uncomfortable with the word or concept of prayer, but setting an intention feels less foreign and awkward. What is essential is to ask with heartfelt sincerity for insistence, guidance, or healing for yourself or another. The second commonality is the expression of gratitude and appreciation for all the blessings in our lives. No matter how much we are suffering and how much we wish things were different, there is still always so much to be grateful for. There is a huge body of research about the uplifting impact a regular gratitude practice has upon mood and your level of happiness. I suggest to my patients that they find a beautiful journal and that they dedicate to, that they dedicate to this purpose and write three things nightly before sleep that they feel grateful for. They can be small things. Examples include the excitement with which your pet greeted you when you walked in the door, the pleasure of cool, fresh sheets, or the bright red of the cardinal at the bird feeder. The third practice that Dr. Arian described is to take physical action in the world, such as one that increases the amount of beauty, or to do acts of kindness and charity, or to say words to uplift, recognize, and encourage another. In other words, to take sacred action. If a person observes these three practices daily, prayer, gratitude, and sacred action, it fosters a feeling of being supported, uplifted, and connected, and protects against feeling worn down by the daily routine, the grim headlines, and the incredible frustrations and hardships of daily life, not to mention the suffering occasioned by living with chronic complex medical illness. I'm keenly aware that many patients that many people suffering from chronic complex medical conditions are so ill 
that they are unable to work, have spent all their savings on medical treatments and are thus in financial distress. Most functional medicine holistic practitioners are not contracted with insurance companies and have fees that are not affordable for those who are in the most desperate need. This is a terrible and unjust situation that is deeply systemic, rooted in capitalism and the structure of our for-profit healthcare system. I do not have a solution. What I can say is that in my experience, some of the most profoundly healing approaches are anti-inflammatory diet, minimizing exposure to toxins, sleep, appropriate movement, limbic system retraining, community connection and support, spiritual practice and spending time communing with nature. All of these blessings are relatively inexpensive as compared to paying out of pocket to see a functional medicine doctor privately. Next slide, please. This slide is a picture of the cover of my book, Sacred Psychiatry, and a link to the author's page where you can read the introduction. If you enjoy it, please order a copy, and I would be very grateful if you like it, if you would leave reviews on Amazon and Goodreads, as reviews increase a book's visibility. Next slide, please. This slide is a list of a few wonderful books relevant to this talk. Next slide, please. I hope that this talk will provide some fresh perspectives and new tools to explore. During this era of transformation and breakdown on our planet, it is more important than ever to tune into the heart, to cultivate feelings of love and respect for oneself, for one another and the natural world. It's of vital importance during these times to foster a sense of community. So it's wonderful that you are all here today. It's been an honor and a privilege to be here with you May what you have learned be for your highest good and for the highest good of all concerned. And may each of you be speedily restored to wholeness and a profound sense of well-being. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Um, I want to thank you, Judy, for your presentation. That was incredible. Um, and I'd like to shift us to the Q&A portion today. Um, so I want to thank everyone for bearing with us for some technical difficulties, but thankfully we still have time um, to run through some questions. So. Um, Again, I just want to remind everyone to submit the questions that you have to the Q&A portion um, in, the, in the webinar function where the chat is. Um, so we'll start taking those. And um, I know you spoke to, I'll kick us off with a question. Um, I really appreciate your perspective on um, what patients can do if they can't access this kind of care. Um, and obviously there might not be really concrete solutions to the distribution of taking insurance and not, but as a provider, um, I'm really curious to hear how you um, came to to that kind of practice um, to be able to see patients. Is that a decision that um, you took to be able to give patients the kind of time and assessments that they needed? So I don't really understand the question. I mean, this is the sort of practice that I have and um, patients come to see me because this is kind of what I offer. Right. Uh, how do I clarify? I guess to say, um, do you feel like that that structure is necessary to um, integrate the kind of practice that you have? Like, could you do your practice as say, like how traditional um, appointments go, you know, like shorter visits? Oh, those kinds of no, things. not at like, all. I mean, it, it just requires a lot of time. I mean, I, you know, I send patients a really extensive form to fill out before we meet and then I take time to read it and then we meet for an hour and a half and I really like get to know them. And it's not like a, um, you know, a very time subscribed uh, medical appointment uh, where there's a lot of need to, you know, interface with the medical record. And um, it's, it's very, very, very different. It's, it's much more, um, Kind of homespun and um it's uh, very personalized mm -hmm. that makes a lot of sense um from our chat we have quite a few questions um regarding uh the low dose naltrexone that you were discussing um i i'm not sure if this was clear to some people but is that something that can be compounded or does that need to be prescribed by a physician 
it needs to be prescribed by a physician, but you can't get it unless it's compounded. So the physician needs to prescribe it to a compounding pharmacy. Okay. Um, the other question that we had relating to that was um, in terms of um, time of day for taking it, um, is uh, morning dosing something that you would suggest for people who couldn't adjust to um, a bedtime or like PM? Definitely. I would suggest taking in the morning if it's an issue causing insomnia. Uh, supposedly, it is preferable to prescribe it, to, to, to take it before sleep, but if that's not possible, then it makes sense to try taking it in the morning. Okay. Um, one of the other questions we have, um, I'm not sure what this acronym is, but they're asking if you have found that LENS neurofeedback or FSM um, frequency specific microcurrent um, are beneficial for MCAS. Um, I think both of them probably are. I have some experience with FSM. I actually trained in that modality prior to the pandemic, but it's like an in-person modality. And so then after I trained in it, it wasn't possible to make use of it because of the pandemic. And then I haven't pursued continuing to try to make use of it in my practice, but I am under the impression that it can be helpful. And I don't know that much about the lens neurofeedback system, but I also have the impression that it can be helpful, mm -hmm. but I'm not, I'm not expert about that. Sure. Um, I know a few people put in the chat, they really appreciated your um, discussion of um, EMF sources and things. Um, one person is asking if um, electric vehicles fit into that category of an EMF source. I think it does, you know, um, and probably somebody who is like very sensitive that they wouldn't, you know, they would feel more uncomfortable or more symptomatic with an electric car. Um, but it's, it's, I mean, the, the electricity is everywhere, you know, like we we're exposed to it, like constantly with our hair dryer, with the blender, with the toaster, with everything, you know, it's, you have to kind of, um, just do what you can. Sure. And I'm sure that's a really poignant question as, um, Electric vehicle technology is obviously similar to cell phones, like you said, you know, expanding currently. Um, one other question that we have um, for someone who um, is coming from New York, I know you spoke specifically about the regulations with ketamine therapy in Massachusetts where you practice. Um, but if you know anything about New York, um, this person is asking how one might go about finding a psychiatrist who uses ketamine in their practice. I think I would just Google and look for ketamine assisted psychotherapy. I, I, I'm pretty sure that it's um, legal in every state. So um, it's, I mean, it's, it's a medicine that has been around forever. It's on the list of the World Health Organization's list of essential medicines because it's um, so safe and um, like it's used in pediatric surgery a lot at, in Vietnam, it was like the buddy drug. The soldiers would carry it in case their comrades were wounded. Um, so it's it's widely available, but you want to find, I mean, I think it's just very important to find somebody who is paying attention to set and setting because, you know, always like in our culture, when there's money to be made, like these high dose IV infusions of ketamine clinics have sprung up around them. And there's also... Um, you know, online, people can do it by themselves at home with, I, I just think it's very important to try and find somebody who's going to practice in a caring, responsible way. Sure. Um, so I know we're at 456. I think we can squeeze in a couple questions and then we'll move on to announcing our next events. Um, so one person is also asking um, what the role of lab work can be in diagnosing MCAS. Um, it seems like allergists kind of, um, or the quote says, allergists seem to take another tack, and I'm wondering why. Mm -hmm. Well, um, one of the people who's most famous um, writing about MCAS is Dr. Larry Afrin, and he would never like think it was adequate to diagnose it just clinically the way I do. He does some very fancy lab tests, but as I understand the labs need to be handled in such a special way that very often the way that they're drawn, they end up like not being valid. Um, th there are 
you know, tests that can confirm it, but the labs have to be done exactly appropriately and they're expensive and, as I said, not um, very user-friendly. I see. Um, I think um, trying to prioritize some of our questions here that are coming in for our last one. Um, I know um, we've been talking about this insurancing, but a lot of people are asking, how to identify providers um, that take insurance or offer um, sliding scale fees? Do you know? I, I just think that you would need to call the particular provider and ask them. Um, I don't know of any kind of database of, about that. Mm -hmm. Sure. Okay, well, thank you, Judy, for answering all these questions. I know everyone really enjoyed this talk, and I really want to thank you again for, for speaking with us today. It was my pleasure and privilege to speak to all of you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, everyone. So uh, we just wanted to close out with announcing um, our next event. Um, and as a reminder that um, today's recording will be posted on the Mass ME YouTube channel um, as soon as we can. And that you'll get an email when the recording is up. And we, of course, encourage anyone to share the video with your family and friends on social media, anyone you'd like. Um, so the, the next Sunday conversation will be on the 18th of February, the third Sunday of the month per usual at 4 p.m. Eastern time. And um, as Judy mentioned, and some of you may have gotten the survey in an email, um, we're going to continue our series focusing on specific comorbidities. And um, we invite our audience to participate in small groups small group format discussions um, for those living with ME-CFS and other conditions. Um, these are just two graphics we wanted to include um, to kind of summarize our survey results. Um, I'd really like to thank all of you who are able to fill out the interest survey on what you'd be most interested in hearing from us um, shown in these two graphs. Um, so on the right side is the results um, from the ranking. We asked people to select from the uh, pre-established comorbidities that are kind of known. Um, which ones you would be in blue most interested in hearing. And if it wasn't in your top three in the orange that you would, you know, still be interested in hearing. Um, so POTS and dysautonomia as well as MCAS were really at the top of the list. So really happy that we're kind of, Judy is already getting us an introduction um, to these conditions. Um, and you can see the further results below. And on the left side, um, this was a graph of our uh, free responses, um, things that we didn't identify that you would still be interested in hearing. Um, and some of the most requested portions included um, neurodivergence, things including ADHD or autism, as well as digestive issues. So um, we will be extending the series and we'll be culminating um, speakers and topics related to these um, priorities as you guys have kind of nominated them. So we're excited to announce that these upcoming events will focus on dysautonomia and mold and we may be reaching out to some of you who provided your contacts um, or suggested speakers uh, as we craft pro other programs in this series. And next slide. So finally, if you have found this program worthwhile, uh, there are a few ways you can help. You can make a donation to support this series by donating online at this website, massmecfs.org slash donate. And on the same page, you can sign up for the Mass ME newsletter, if you're not already, and donate uh, $25 or more, you can check the option for become a member, and that will establish your membership or renew it, and you'll be invited to our members-only programs. So I want to thank you all for coming again, and we hope to see you next month in February. Thank you.